Where the rubber meets the road. Good news, your home and your friends. At part two tonight, we've looked at the first part of that as we saw the way in which Peter opened his home, or the home in which he was staying in Joppa, and how Cornelius opened his home, and how we saw God working a mighty work of salvation in Cornelius' home. That section there in Acts chapter 10, which is where we are tonight, we'll be looking at verses 28 through 48. That section opens with a picture of reciprocal hospitality. And in the midst of that, God teaches us that sometimes he sends people our way that may not be what we were expecting. But God expects us to offer them hospitality. Remember, our homes do not belong to us. Our homes belong to God. It's merely a stewardship that we are to use for his glory. We saw, as we looked at that initial session, that hospitality is one of the every believer gifts. It's one of those gifts listed in Romans chapter 12 as a spiritual gift. And God expects us to exercise our spiritual gifts. And within the context of those gifts which he is listing as every believer gifts, and following the gift of giving, he speaks about distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality, verse 13 of Romans chapter 12. We saw this very important, especially for those who are in positions of leadership to be exercising hospitality. It's required of elders, and a man is not qualified without the exercise of hospitality. 1 Timothy 3.2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. In Titus, Paul writes the same thing in verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. And we'll see how that ties in with hospitality tonight, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Peter was an elder, and Peter is the one who is exercising hospitality here in the book of Acts. 1 Peter 5.1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And of course, as we gave an overview, we noted the fact that your home is one of the very best places to set the stage for witnessing. Open Our Homes gives us an opportunity to witness to others with the gospel. And sometimes it means that they will open their homes to us as well. When we obey the call to witness, God always expands that witness. We saw that happening as Cornelius opened his home not only to Peter, but invited all of his kinsmen and near friends. The third major principle we learned last time was when you open your home, your reciprocal invitation will introduce you to others beyond your original contacts. It's one of the very interesting things that has occurred all across this land as well as in other nations around the world is that homes that are open for the teaching of the Word of God often become points whereby other homes become open for the teaching of the Word of God. When you open your home, your reciprocal invitation will introduce you to others beyond your original contacts. And so we summarized our last session together with two principles that we saw from Acts chapter 10. Hospitality introduced Peter to the Gentiles. Hospitality introduced the Gentiles to Christ. God prepared the hearts of those who were his elect. He drew them to the appointed place and he used people who had opened their homes for the opening of the gospel so that it would reach us today. Then we noted a principle which I'd like to expand on tonight. The key issue is the message, not the messenger. The key issue is the message, not the messenger. 
You don't open your home so that you can show people all the neat things that you have. You don't open your home so that you can gain kudos for yourself. You don't open your home so that other people will be embarrassed by what their homes look like. The key is the message, not the messenger. You know, there are many cults that know the secret of home evangelization. In fact, almost all of the cults use what we see going on here in the book of Acts. And they are quite successful in that usage. For example, the Jehovah's Witnesses always want you to let them into your home to do a home Bible study. Have you ever heard them or had them knock on your door? And yes, they try to sell you some literature. They always sell it, though for a very reasonable and cheap price, because they know that Christians would take the literature if it were free and then throw it away. But they also know that Christians do not want to give money to a cult, so the Christians won't buy the literature. So that way they make sure that their literature gets into the home, where it is the first seed that is planted. And then they make follow-up calls on all those who have bought their literature and again offer them a home Bible study before they ever try to get them to come to a kingdom hall. They want to establish personal contact. They want to get into the home so that they can reach those people with their perverted message. Mormons are famous for their family devotional times to ground their children in Mormonism and then bring their children's friends into their homes. That is standard operating procedure in Mormonism. Ground your children in the home and then have your children bring non-Mormons to the home to join in these fun family times together. The Bible warns about those who creep into houses with false doctrine. Second Timothy chapter 3. We know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, trucebreakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, describes the United States today, for having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. He's been describing a particular group of teachers here because the next verse says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They creep into houses. So I think it's biblical to call these guys creeps. They creep into houses. But you know, there are many so-called home Bible studies that have led to perversion of sound doctrine and to immoral activity. You say, well, then we shouldn't do it, right? No, that only emphasizes the effectiveness of using our homes as points of hospitality and evangelism. Satan understands the power of that principle which God himself has established. So, as we've noted with the, all these cultic illustrations, you have competition. Because the devil has seen the effective use of the home as a basis for evangelism, discipleship, and doctrinal training. Now, you recall that we saw an illustration of a man who took credit and glory for himself. Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, verse 9. He was out there winning people to himself. And Satan has his agents everywhere. And you know something? Often your home will be the only place that you can talk one-on-one -on -one in a relaxed atmosphere without interruption. Now, I know some years ago I gave you this illustration, but I'd like to give the illustration again because I want to emphasize that point. Sometimes you have to go where those folks are located because they don't want to come to your home, but you always run the risk 
of having your witness interrupted. Many, many years ago, when I was serving as a pastor up in North Jersey, I had a man in my church who had been saved out of a very rough background. But he really had an earnest zeal and desire to see the other members of his family come to Christ. His name was Phil. He had a brother whose name was Roy. Roy was a severe drunkard. Roy owned a restaurant with a bar in it, and Roy was his own best customer. Roy ran prostitutes out of his restaurant in a seedy place up in North Jersey. Phil desperately wanted to see Roy come to Christ. So one evening I went with Phil to Roy's restaurant. Roy was there and Phil had been witnessing to him and Roy was was open to listening to the gospel. So we sat down at one of the tables there in the restaurant and I began to share Christ with him. And it became a very intense discussion. And not too far away at a small table there was a man sitting drinking his mug of beer and listening in on our conversation. And after a few minutes he pulled up his chair to our table and says, um, this is an interesting conversation, do you mind if I join it? And so we said, certainly, you can join. And he began to try to interfere with everything that I said. It was almost like Elymas the sorcerer. It was almost like bar -Jesus the guy who stood against Paul when he was preaching to Sergius Paulus. And he continued to insist that what I was saying should not be heard. He was a regular customer there at the bar. So he had some influence with Roy. Finally, I asked him to leave, and Roy assented to that. That evening, Roy placed his faith in Jesus Christ and was saved. Two weeks later, he was dead. Phil managed to talk the family into letting me do the graveside. Because he was a nominal Catholic, the service was held at a Roman Catholic church. But the family let me do the graveside. It was a cold, freezing cold, windy, slightly rainy day. Gray clouds all across the sky. The grave wasn't set up as usual. There was not a tent over it. Where I stood, the only place I could in that particular situation was with my back to the open grave. And the crowd gathered around, looking at me, many of them with great hateful eyes. The priest was bobbing around behind the audience as I spoke. And I shared the simple gospel with that group of very, very hard people. I almost was afraid that some of them might want to try to push me right into the hole. After I was finished and shared how Phil had told me about Roy and how Roy had trusted in Christ, I closed in prayer. The group began to disperse. We were walking back to our cars and a very hardened older woman came up to me and identified herself as one of the prostitutes that had been running out of Roy's bar. She had tears in her eyes. And she said to me, Those were wonderful words that you spoke. 
that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But be warned, when you are witnessing in a public place, you may have interference. God can overcome that. But where you will have the most effect is in your home. We find those who stand against the gospel, Acts chapter 13, verse 6. I mentioned it a moment ago. When they had gone through the island Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. It sort of reminds you of Cornelius. He was warned by an angel, call for a man named Saul. He has something to say to you. And so he gathered together family and friends and they heard the gospel and were saved. Now here's a man who's a prudent man and who wants to hear something from, from Saul. He desired to hear the word of God, but Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his interpret, er, name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Very much like that fellow in the bar tried to turn Roy away from hearing the gospel. He was a man who already had influence on Roy, just like Sergius Paulus was already influenced by Elymas the sorcerer. Those people wanted to preach a different gospel, wanted a different way of salvation, didn't want people to understand that they were sinners and lost and headed for hell. Another proof, as we've noted, is a man is not from God when he seeks to pervert the gospel so that he can make money off his perversion. There are a lot of men standing in pulpits today that the only reason they're there is because they're making a very hefty salary. And they are entertaining their crowds. And they are telling lots of jokes. And they are giving the people the pablum that they want to hear. The scripture warns against that, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That's Paul to Titus. Peter says the same thing. Second Peter chapter 2, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not in their damnation, slumbereth not. They make merchandise of you. They're doing it for money. Christ bought us, they sell us. Writing Timothy, Paul says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. Well, that must prove that I have the right message. Look at all the money that's pouring in. Or chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But they that will be rich fall into the temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while while some coveted after... They have erred from the faith. <clears throat> Money offers the temptation to turn from the faith, just to alter the message a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Just to alter the message a little bit so that the people and the money will start to flow. But they not only turn from the faith, but they pierce themselves through. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Paul makes it clear that that was not his method. 2 Corinthians 12, 17 and 18. He's writing to the Corinthians. He says, look, when I came to Corinth, when I shared the gospel with you, did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? very important to understand 
that that is one of the key ways in which you determine who is a heretic, an apostate, one who's a creep, creeping into houses with his false doctrine. But you know, there are some dangers and some warnings to heretics who try to use God's methods for personal gain. We find seven sons of Sceva, who was a priest of the Jews, and they were going around to different houses and making some money by throwing demons out. And in chapter 19 of Acts, it says, The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. <laughs> Those who are using the homes of others to spread their false doctrine, their false practices, need to be warned by passages like that. There's also a warning to you as a Christian in your use of hospitality that's given to us over in 1 Timothy chapter 5. You see, hospitality can be abused, your hospitality can be abused, by carnal Christians who will waste your time. The warning here is for the church not to support young widows. And Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5.13, And with all they learn to be idle, not wandering about from house to house. Yeah, they're taking advantage of your hospitality. They know what the scripture says about you having to open your home to others. It says they wander about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. The rumor mill of the church. And that's why he says the younger widows should remarry. They should guide the house. They should live godly and sober lives. And we find the Apostle Paul giving instructions even about older widows. He said a widow shouldn't be taken into the number under threescore years old, that's 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, one who has washed the saints' feet, one who's exercised hospitality. Those are the ones who are true widows, who have no one else to care for them, for whom the church can care. Hospitality was one of the first marks of the early church, and it was a proof of the love that they had one for another. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost has just occurred. We find 3,000 Jewish men are saved on the day of Pentecost. We've already seen how that group of saved people was all male. And so when we begin to look at hospitality in the context of Acts chapter 2, it is primarily men as the head of their homes who are opening their homes to others. Listen to what it says. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were opening their homes. They were having worship. They were what, celebrating what we call communion, the breaking of the bread from house to house. They were opening their homes in hospitality, and this wasn't just because a bunch of women who were dominant pushed their husbands out of the way and said, we're open in our house. This was primarily men who were involved here in Acts chapter 2. The early church was active in home evangelism and discipleship. Acts chapter 5, verse 42, and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The church is open for evangelism and discipleship. That was the standard practice of the early church. We find that even Saul, before his conversion, realized the foundational nature of the homes of the believers for their worship, their evangelism, and for their training and discipleship. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. And so he went to every church building and waited for them to show up for services and then arrested them. <laughs> no, that's not what it says, is it? Entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Saul himself was saved and baptized in a house. Acts 9, 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And as you know, we talked about the, the verb that's used there, and, 
and standing he was baptized. God called Cornelius in his house. God opened the gospel to the Gentiles in his home. Chapter 10, verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Many of the early churches met in homes rather than in a church building, both for worship and for prayer. We see a great illustration of this in Acts chapter 12. Where is the first Peter, place that Peter goes after he's been arrested? He's chained with between four quaternions of soldiers. He's chained with them. He's got them standing outside the door. He's got them standing outside the gate. And then there's a gate to the city. And the angel comes, whacks him on the side. Peter's sleeping soundly in the middle of the night. He knows he's okay. What God wants, God will accomplish. The angel wakes him up. He thinks he's seeing a vision. The chains drop off. The soldiers are still sound asleep or standing there as though they are. The prison door opens. He walks out. They go through the first gate, goes out. The gate to the city opens. He goes out. The angel goes with him for a block and disappears. And Peter, coming to himself, suddenly realizes, wow, I guess this is real. He says he paused and considered it for a minute. And then where did he go? <clears throat> he thought, I think I'll run over to the church building and see if the janitor is there late and see if he has any ideas what I ought to do. <laughs> No, that's not what it says. Listen to this, Acts 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. He knew that the disciples met in homes for worship, for prayer, for Bible study. He thought, now, what day of the week is this? Whose house are they meeting in tonight? And he went right to the spot, and there were the believers. And they were praying for him. And they didn't believe it when he knocked on the door. And Rhoda comes to the door. She hears Peter's voice. She's a scatterbrained teenager, probably. She's so excited, she runs back in without opening the door and tells him, Peter's outside, Peter's outside, Peter's outside. No, 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 we're praying for Peter right now. You need to understand, he'll probably get killed, and so we need to pray for grace for Peter, so that when they take him up there, that he won't deny Jesus, and so that he'll be brave. And No, Peter is at the door! Okay, Peter's knocking. Let's go see who's at the door. They open it and they are shocked. It is Peter. What were they doing? In a house. That home had been opened for a 24-hour prayer meeting that was going on that night for Peter. And God answered prayer. Churches that met in homes. Let me give you some more illustrations. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Colossians 4.15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. Philemon 2. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Let's look at an illustration where we see some evangelism going on. Acts chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. And Paul, after he leaves the synagogue, they're arguing. He's been preaching in the synagogue. They argue. They don't like what he said, and there's a division among the Jews. And he, that is Paul, departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. They shared a common wall. Paul didn't do, go too far when he left that synagogue there in Corinth. And Paul was preaching, and he apparently preached loud enough to be heard through the wall of the synagogue. And who's in the synagogue most of the time would have been the chief rabbi of the synagogue. Listen what happened. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Paul, writing back to the Corinthians, recalls this incident. He says, the ones that he remembered baptizing, Gaius and Crispus and the household of Stephanus, besides which I know not whether I baptized any others. It tells us many of them believed and were baptized here. But Paul didn't keep the baptismal records so that he could say, now, Corinth, let's see, I baptized 470. He remembered three. And one of those was Crispus, who was the chief ruler of the synagogue, who probably heard Paul continue to preach in the house of justice 
which shared a common wall with the synagogue. And then others hearing believed. It tells us that after Paul left the synagogue and went to the house of justice. A home used for evangelism with a built-in amplification system directly into the synagogue. We discover that one of the first reactions of new believers in the New Testament is to open their homes to hospitality to other Christians. Acts chapter 16, in verse 15, speaking of Lydia, it says, And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. As you know, shortly thereafter, Paul and Silas are arrested and thrown into prison there in Philippi. And after the brouhaha with the uh, Philippian jailer and the jail being ripped open at night and the Philippian jailer being saved, and we'll talk about him in a second, the magistrates of the city were forced, because Paul was a Roman citizen, to come and release him themselves. And very, very apologetically, they did so and asked him to leave. And you know, Lydia could have said, you know, I, I don't want to stir up the waters because after they leave town, the town council could give me some grief. You know what she did? It says, they went out of the prison and they entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Unashamed of the open identification with Paul and Silas, even after the prison experience. We find that Paul evangelized the Philippian jailer in the jailer's own home, Acts 16.32. We find that they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. We find the jailer immediately exercised hospitality to Paul and Silas in his own home, even though Paul was still at that time technically a prisoner. Verse 34, And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. New believers tend to be more excited about inviting folks into their homes. Other pagans who exercised hospitality to Christians ended up getting saved. Look at Acts chapter 28. In the same quarters were the possessions. This is after the shipwreck on the island of Malta and where Paul and the rest all make it safely to shore and they build a fire and a snake comes out of the fire and latches onto Paul's hand and Paul shakes it off into the fire and all the pagans think, man, this guy must be a murderer or somebody really, really, really bad. You know, because even though he got away from the sea god, sea god didn't manage to kill him yet, we got the snake god and the snake god got him. But after a while they saw that he didn't swell up or fall down dead, so they decided he must be a god. <laughs> How quickly pagans' minds can change. But we find something else taking place. We find in the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us courteously three days, and Paul heals his father of a bloody flux, and Publius is saved. Because he opened his house to Paul, who shared with him the gospel, and demonstrated its truth, in this case, by healing Publius' father. Being a single man or an old man is not an excuse not to exercise hospitality. Acts 21.16 There went with us certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. Apparently an old single guy. And it emphasizes that he was old with whom we should lodge. You know, Paul went house to house to spread the gospel and to disciple and teach, but not for the purpose of making money. Paul reminds the Ephesian elders of what he had done in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, in his farewell speech to the elders at Ephesus. He's on his way to Rome. And he reminds them how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Philip was a church leader who exercised hospitality as required in scripture, even though he was an evangelist. And we think normally of evangelists traveling all over the place and not having some place that they really call home. And when they're there, nobody gets to get into it. But Philip exercised hospitality, Acts 21.8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. We didn't just go in to say hi. They stayed there. 
Paul used his rented house as a place for evangelism and discipleship. Acts 28.30 And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. Are you getting the picture of the book of Acts? Are you getting the picture of what took place in the early church? You know, Christ is our example, even though he had no earthly house, yet we are his house. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, But Christ has a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confession, the confidence, and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Peter makes mention of the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable by God to Jesus Christ. A house where sacrifices can be offered. And Paul explains that in Hebrews. The sacrifice of our lips and thankful hearts. A place for worship. But you need to realize that that is also why God prohibits you from allowing false teachers into your homes or wishing them well. Second John chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. <clears throat> We're talking about what might cost you your rewards? You gain rewards for using the stewardship God has given you the way he tells you, but you lose rewards for not using it the way he told you to use it. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both Father and the Son. Verse 10. If there come any unto you bringing not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. <clears throat> I know there are many Christians who, when the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons have come to their doors, have opened the door and let those people come in. They just lost some heavenly rewards. Because the scripture specifically commands you that you must not let them into your house. Neither bid him Godspeed, as we would say, have a nice day. <clears throat> God bless your journey, Godspeed. You don't want God to bless their journey. You don't want them to go to the next house and get in there and convert somebody to Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or whatever other cult is out there knocking on doors. Verse 11, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Your house belongs to Jesus Christ. You are to use it in the way that he has commanded, and you are not to use it in the way that he has forbidden. In other words, your home is a stewardship that belongs to God. It needs to be used in the manner that he commands and for no other purposes. Jesus talked about stewards, and he explained the responsibilities. Luke chapter 12, verse 42. The Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom the Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. The stewards in Christ's parables who exercised their stewardship properly had their stewardship multiplied. Those who dealt with talents were given not merely talents but cities to rule over. Jesus speaks of it again in chapter 16, verse 2. We are going to give an account for our stewardship. It says, And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. God can take away from us anything that he wants to with a mere whisper, including our homes. Give an account for your stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Titus 1.7, in the context of hospitality, as we've read before, but let me share the first verse 
in that series. A bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. 1 Corinthians 4.1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You say, okay, okay, but there aren't any verses that really apply that to my home, are there? It's just an implication that you're giving here, right? No, wrong. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift of so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The stewardship in the immediate context is your home and the exercise of hospitality. In other words, it should be evident that God not only permits, but God expects and commands us to open our homes for evangelism, for discipleship, for worship, for prayer, for Bible study, because you see, our homes do not belong to us. Our homes belong to God. Now, you've heard what the scripture has to say on this subject. The question is, what will you do about it? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. It is blunt, it's pointed, it tends to rub us wrong. It tends to step on our toes in areas where we'd rather not have our toes stepped on. But your word is true. And as we look at the book of Acts, and as we see the habitual practice of the early church and the massive spread of the gospel of Christ, and the tremendous blessing that people had through that fellowship and that opportunity of reaching to neighbors, and others within their circle of acquaintance and to relatives and friends. Why is it that only the cults seem to be using those techniques today? The devil understands what works. He understands how you have established certain principles that always work. And yet we have backed off from it because we are interested in ourselves rather than in others. Forgive us, Father, for our sins and cleanse us. You've promised to do so in your word. And we pray that you might enable us, as we have seen in the scripture, to exercise the kind of hospitality of which the scripture speaks. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn to begin with was a hymn of commitment.